few days ago, tons of headlines in the tech press were saying that we had finally gotten victory over the carriers and that cell phone carriers were complying with the FCC's rules to make it possible to unlock your cell phone. A researcher here in San Francisco, though, says that it's not quite that simple. Here with me is Sina Kanafar, who's a entrepreneur and also a digital rights activist. And, and you just had a post this week that said that, that it's not so cut and dry, that carriers aren't exactly complying in the ways that they want us to believe they are. What's going on here? That's right. So the CTIA, which is like the industry group that represents all the different carriers, um, promised a year ago, so right at the end of 2013, that within a year they'd implement six principles, and they're pretty basic principles. They're not, you know, you know, they're not like very, very liberal unlocking policies, but they're kind of basics. You know, they'd unlock cell phones for prepaid customers, for postpaid customers, and do these six different items. Um, and so the the self-imposed deadline they that they suggested uh, was, I think, February 13th. Um, of, so just last week, right? Um, and that that we hit that sort of marker that date, and there was a big flurry of press, and it was sort of kicked off by the FCC. Put out uh, an announcement saying we're proud that all the carriers have you know implemented these really liberal unlocking policies, and you know great work. And the tech press all came out and kind of said basically the same thing: Yay, unlocking is now going to be easy on every carrier. And so one of the things I, I, I did when I saw the news, I was like, right, well, that, that sounds great. But I went and sort of checked in and went, went through each of the carriers unlocking policies. And there's a couple who are OK, and there are some that are just really terrible. So um, who, are the, who are the worst offenders here? So the worst offenders, um, the, the, so, so some of the not all carriers signed up for the join the voluntary agreement. The four major carriers did, though. So Sprint, Verizon, T-Mobile, and AT&T. Mm -hmm. Um, out of those four, uh, T-Mobile and Sprint were probably the worst. Um, so they only met about half of the six requirements, so three or four of them at most. Now, how is it possible for them to get away with this? You know, it's a really weird one. I don't know how this slipped through the net. I guess the FCC wanted to be able to declare victory on this, um, and it doesn't really seem like they pushed back. You know, what, you know, they sort of, the carriers suggested this thing, the FCC said okay, and a year later, the carrier said they'd done it, and the FCC said OK. And, and that was basically the long and short of it. And now, what was the criteria that you searched for? Did you just essentially go through all of their terms of service? That's right. So I, didn't, I wasn't even more strict than the carriers themselves had suggested. So there's lots of things that we might ask for. So one big thing is you unlock your phone. You want to take it to another carrier and use it. It's called interoperability. The other carrier has to accept your phone. So any reasonable unlocking policy would have that as you know, as part of it. As long as the phone's compatible with your new network, you should be able to hook it up and use it. That's not, for example, one of the CTIA's suggested six things. I just went through those six things, and Sprint and T-Mobile were failing on half of them. Um, if, if you look at, you know, a, a more reasonable consumer-forward um, unlocking policy, that they, they all did pretty terribly. Now, this post of yours and this research that you had just came out yesterday, and it's already sort of taken off. Have you heard anything from representatives at you know, Sprint or T-Mobile about this? Yeah, so T-Mobile, so one of the things carriers are supposed to do is notify their customers when they're eligible for unlocking. And this one was a vague one. I tried reaching out to, for example, AT&T's reps and got sort of mixed responses on what they're actually doing. Uh, T-Mobile this morning actually emailed and said that they've started putting notifications in, in, in people's bills. So they didn't really specify this, they didn't really say anywhere on the unlocking policy what they were doing, but now you get a little line on your, on your bill saying Which we you're all eligible. read through. Everyone so reads that, right, say, right, of course. Yeah, yeah of so course. it seems like they're really squeaking by here. Who yeah. are the most disappointed with here? I mean, so it seems like the press certainly didn't do our job in, in really you know, investigating this. Who, who's at fault here? You know, I, I would put most of the fault on the FCC, to be honest. So one of the things, like one of the general problems with this whole approach of a voluntary agreement is that it's not really very enforceable, right? Carriers can change their unlocking policies. They can make it very difficult for individuals. There's lots of people who've written or commented on different blog posts and said it's been really hard for them to unlock their phones even after this voluntary agreement went into place. Um, but the FCC, yeah, the voluntary agreement is just a little bit of a joke. One, one big you know, one big ex like exception to this whole thing is TrackPhone. So, TrackPhone is a is a uh, prepaid network, right? So, um, and it generally tends to be the people who buy 
prepaid devices or in people who don't have credit in lower socioeconomic classes. Right. TrackPhone didn't agree to any of the voluntary unlocking principles and they basically don't have any unlocking policy at all. So they, they basically say, we, they have a policy that basically says, we might someday maybe let you unlock your phone and that's about it. That's about it. Um, so that, that's like one of the ways that, that the FCC's job is to regulate and make sure these things happen and they're completely failing to. And not only are they failing to, they're failing for like the class of citizens that perhaps most need the protection. Right, I thought that was the interesting thing and, and one thing that I've heard a lot of digital activists talk about is that it'd be really bad if we had a future where it was people who could afford to have privacy and afford to have these things that should actually be rights for all of us. And then there's this entire lower class of people who, who can't afford that and so they have to opt in to all of these you know, really invasive things. Yeah, exactly. That's right. And and it's generally like that, like the long tail of devices. Like the iPhone is generally reasonably okay to unlock through each of the carriers, but it's all the other devices that get locked that are more complicated and more difficult. And it's you know, iPhones are expensive. Not everyone's buying iPhones. Yeah. So what do you what do you suggest that we do from here? If unlocking is important to you, what can you do to make sure that this is actually happening? Yeah, sure. So there's two sides that I think are particularly important. One is the FCC side. The FCC should really either do a rulemaking and make proper rules around what unlocking policies should look like um, and when people should be allowed to unlock their phones. Ideally, in my view, you know, there are countries, I think China, Israel, there's a few countries that ban unlocking phones outright. And it doesn't hurt their wireless industries. It's good for consumers and it's not really bad for the carriers. So ideally that would be the case. Uh, barring that, they should at least have really clear rules on when carriers have to unlock devices for consumers. So that's one side of it. The other side of it that I've spent a lot of time working on is even if you um, don't have your carrier's permission, you still should be able to unlock your phone, right? Um, and so for example, let's say you've bought an iPhone, you're still within your one year, so AT&T won't unlock your phone for you. Um, you should be able to, you know, you bought the device, right? You're locked in via a contract, you have an early termination fee, but it's your phone. If you want to go to Spain and don't want to have to pay roaming fees, for example, you're traveling, whatever it might be, you should be able to, you know, buy some software that unlocks your phone. But unfortunately, because of weird copyright laws that we have, that's not the case either. Um, you know, there are services out there that through however sketchy means will unlock your iPhone. They cost a hundred bucks. There's a really big incentive for someone to write software for this, but they don't because a law called the DMCA, um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, has this weird provision that was supposed to prevent privacy. Uh, sorry, prevent piracy, piracy. my bad. Um, but is actually being used to threaten people who write software that circumvents these kinds of locks. And even the FCC, I noticed, uh, has an FAQ on their website, and they say, you know, under the DMCA, it's it's very likely illegal for you to unlock unlock your phones on your own, which right. is which is crazy. It's you know, copyright kind of gone mad because it, it, there's no copyright infringement at all when you unlock a phone, and yet you're potentially liable for. Uh, five years in jail and five hundred thousand dollars in fines if right. you unlock your phone. So device. it sounds like the the solution might be to to reach out to the FCC if you can, just as an individual, write a letter or something, yeah. and also support organizations like the EFF who are fighting, you know, against these policies and and helping out people who do write these software things. Yeah, that's absolutely right. This is one of the issues uh, EFF and there's another group in DC called Public Knowledge have been working on for a really long time, trying to push for these kinds of reforms. The, the anti-circumvention provision, Section 1201, is just clearly being used in ways that it wasn't you know, um, written for. And I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful that'll get fixed at some point. Um, Congress is doing sort of a big review of copyright at the moment, and it's possible this will be part of it. Hopefully it is. All right, Sina Kanafar, thank you for fighting the good fight. Sure. Yeah, my pleasure.